Hey, uh, welcome back. Um, I guess this is, unless you're like watching this back to back or something. Um, I am trying to do these uh, so that you can watch them at your pace and give you um, due dates that are out there so that you can plan on sitting down and watching the video, watching it two or three times, making it go viral on YouTube if you if you have to, um, and uh, answering the questions. Um, there will be like normal homework sheets. I'm working on a couple of them. I know that's pretty exciting. I mean, you're probably looking forward to that. A little more writing. Um, yeah. Well, today is really going to be about gerrymandering. And um, again, so this is the website. Um, this is where the remote learning stuff is. I put it in order in case you get confused. I don't know what it looks like from your side. Um, and so it's in order there, the order that I want you to do it. Um, this is the email too. Don't be afraid to email me if you got something going on. You have, to have a question. I know you can do that through Google Classroom too, which is which is fine. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, good enough. So let's let's get into this thing. Um, where last we left off, um, we did Nancy Pelosi, and um, she was on TV because she's working with um, Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, right now on another stimulus bill uh, for the economic problems with small business. And so uh, she was on some of the Sunday morning chat places. Uh, she was on Fox and ABC, I think. Um, I didn't see either one other than a video later, but that's okay because I'm old and tired. All right, so let's let's get into this gerrymandering thing and let's see if I can do this. Good. All right, so this is the fourth district. This is the district that we live in in Massachusetts. That's a strange. It's a strange looking district. Um, do I have it set up so that I can do that? This is my favorite pointer thing. Um, here's Robeth, right, and here's Dighton, um, Berkeley, you know, Lakeville, Freetown, Taunton. You know, Forever, S Somerset, Swansea. You can't see the Somerset Swansea divide. Looks like it's one place. Seacon, because it's a little sliver here. You get the point. Um, this district is drawn up in a gerrymandered way. What happens is that after every census, which is every 10 years, the census is out there. Remember, I said I wanted to do the census with you guys live um, in, in the lunchroom or something and show you how easy it is to do and, and, it's pretty boring. It was, it's like a click, click, click. It was. It wouldn't have really been great anyway. I did it, but um, no big deal. But after the census is over, um, basically the year later, they have new stats on the number of people living in the United States and where they live. And they, uh, one of the things they do, they use those numbers to to be able to, you know, for government aid to, to cities and towns and hospitals and schools and all those things. And, police and fire. Um, but they also use that to decide, you know, um, how many representatives you can have the Congress. Because as some of the states are growing faster than others, they, they get new congressmen. And some states that aren't growing as fast may lose a congressman. I remember when I first started teaching, Massachusetts had something like, um, I forget the exact number, maybe like 13 or 14 representatives. We're now, we now have, what, nine? Um, so it's not that Massachusetts isn't growing, it's just not as growing as fast. So what happens is um, after every census, once the census is released, it's usually the following year, the state house, the, the, the reps in the state, that would be like Representative Howitt, um, they would get together and redraw the maps. Um, so every 10 years they redraw the maps. If the Democrats control the state house, they tend to draw the maps to make sure that the districts, as many districts as possible, is going to be Democratic. And if the Republicans control it, they do the same thing. Dem a lot of Democrats tend to live more towards cities. Um, and so that's like an easy way of doing things. Uh, the area that we live in, because I'm in Dighton, you're in Rehoboth, is, is very Republican, actually. Um, matter of fact, this whole chunk if you come across and down, um, I mean, you have some Democratic uh, areas. Taunton's pretty Democratic. Fort River and Somerset are pretty uh, Democratic. But the rest are really kind of, they lean Republican. If this map was drawn up more fair, 
um, we would probably have a Republican representing us in the U.S. Congress, but we don't because this this thing ends up like kind of gerrymandering, wandering up into this area, which is very um, Democratic, and then it actually squeezes into Boston, which is wicked heavily populated and heavily Democratic. So it secures this, the fourth congressional district, as a very blue, a very Democratic district. And um, the problem with gerrymandering is that let's say that, that that this was drawn a little bit more fair, and it was there was like a straight line here, and you know, and that was the district, the fourth district, was something like that. You might end up getting a, a Democrat elect, elected because of Fall River and Somerset and Taunton being so Democratic. Um, but it would be close. And that Democrat wouldn't want to aggravate the Republicans too much. That Democrat would work with the Republicans and because he'd want to get, he or she would want to get reelected. If it was Republican that was elected, same thing. I mean, it would want to win over Taunton forever. If it was Republican, it would be close. So that Republican would probably work with the Democrats. And that's the problem with all this gerrymandering that's going across the country. The districts are so safe, Republican or Democrat, that they don't have to work with the opposing party at all. As a matter of fact, it's discouraged to work with the other party. And it's made our politics really, really divisive. This is, been, this is an issue that I really think is really, really important in American politics today. I took that class this summer, and the last, the last project, the Keystone project at the end of the class was to write uh, an amendment to the Constitution. The amendment that I chose was gerrymandering because I think that, you know, it should not. The Constitution allows for states to set up the districts. And um, I think that's a mistake. The state government setting up the districts because they, they, they do this. They do this gerrymandering thing. And um, it makes it so that politicians don't want to work together. And it's made our politics more and more divisive since like the 1980s on. It's really when they started perfecting the science here because they have better statistics of where the Democrats lived and where the Republicans lived. So, but we could have a computer make the districts and it would be really boxy looking and um, it would be definitely more fair. So there is a, there's, there's a more fair way of doing this. Let me show you a couple of things before I... So this is a perfect example of when um, after a, a, the census of 2010, um districts were redrawn so so th this is uh, north carolina north carolina is kind of a swing state it's 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 sometimes controlled by republicans sometimes controlled by democrats so in the 2010 elections 45 percent of the people that went out and voted were voting democrat and 54 percent which is a clear majority were republicans but yet because of the way that the, the districts were gerrymandered um, the Democrats ended up with seven seats in Congress and the Republicans ended up with six seats in Congress, um, which is really not proportionally, you know, that, that can happen that it's not totally proportional, but that's a pretty big difference there. So anyway, the, the Republicans controlled the state house and they got their, their census results in 2011 and they redrew the map and boy, did they redraw the map. Um, in 2018, for example, 48% of the people that went out and voted, voted Democrat. And about 50% um, voted Republican, but they ended up with 10 seats and the Democrats ended up with three. That's because the districts were so poorly drawn. It says here in the, in the, in the explanation that this has gone to the Supreme Court. The problem with the Supreme Court is the Supreme Court only rules that gerrymandering is illegal when it's used to stop people from having uh, political power. Like if, if there's a black section of the state and you can prove that they've just kind of isolated the black or separated the black section up enough so the blacks don't have any uh, representation in Congress. If it's a racial thing, the, the, the Supreme Court makes you redraw the map, the U.S. Supreme Court. Other than that, they kind of are hands off. Um, People have had better political success with fighting gerrymandering in their state Supreme Courts. In a lot of state Supreme Courts, like I, I'm saying this off the top of my head, but I think Pennsylvania, I think um, maybe Illinois, um, 
have been forced, have, the, the states have, the state Supreme Court have forced them to redraw the maps in a more fair way. Um, it's hard for the federal government to do it. All right, so this is gerrymandering. Let's watch this video on gerrymandering. I'll talk a little bit more about gerrymandering. Um, I'll show you the big map and how Democrats and Republicans, they both do it. I don't want you to think that just Democrats do it because that's what we see in Massachusetts, but Republicans do it too. Whoever controls the state house, you're almost like forced to do it. It's like you have this power, you're not gonna use it um, because you can get everything that you care about done. It's almost like they force you to do it. So here's just, this is a good video on uh, gerrymandering. The great. So, you want to know what gerrymandering is? First, let's start with Government 101. In the United States, each state elects a certain number of representatives based on the state's population. The larger your population, the more representatives you have. Each representative represents a district or a geographical area, including its voters. Ideally, we want to have a range of representatives who reflect the political views of the population across the state. But how do we decide who gets to vote for each representative? Let's look at an example. Suppose we have a very tiny state of 50 people. 30 of them belong to the Blue Party and 20 belong to the Red Party. And just our luck, they all live in a nice even grid with blues on one side of the state and reds on the other. Now, let's say we need to divide the state into five districts. Each district will send one representative to the House to represent the people. Fortunately, because our citizens live in a neatly ordered grid, it's easy to draw five lengthy districts, two for the reds and three for the blues. Voila! Perfectly proportional representation, just as the founders intended. Now, let's say instead that the blue party controls the state government, and they get to decide how the lines are drawn. Rather than draw districts horizontally, they draw them vertically, so that in each district there are six blues and four reds. With a comfortable blue majority in the state, each district elects a blue candidate to the house. The blues win five seats, and the reds don't get a single one. Oh well, finally, what if the red party controls the state government? The reds know they're at a numerical disadvantage. But with some creative boundary drawing, they can slice the blue population up such that they only get a majority in two districts. So despite making up 40% of the population, the Reds win 60% of the seats. Not bad. This process of redrawing district lines to give an advantage to one party over another is called gerrymandering, and it's nothing new. The term gerrymander is named after early 19th century Massachusetts Governor Elbridge Gerry, who redrew the map of the Senate's districts in 1810 in order to weaken the opposing Federalist Party. Our example is, of course, a huge simplification. In the real world, people don't live in neatly ordered grids sorted by political party. But for politicians looking to give themselves an advantage at redistricting time, the process is exactly the same, and the consequences are very real. Gerrymandering is at least partly to blame for lopsided representation in the House seen in recent elections. And, it's been argued by the President, for political polarization since representatives don't have to compromise hardline views in order to win seats. And that's really the damage that's done with this is that it, it, um, it makes it so that your district is so safe, Republican or Democrat, that it makes you not want to work with the other people. I mean, part of the problem that we're going through right now with this COVID-19 uh, thing is that the the Republicans don't want to work with the, the Democrats. Democrats don't want to work with the Republicans. And they're pretty safe. It's not like if a Democrat had been elected in this area and they only won by a couple of percentage points and they're refusing to work with the Republicans, they might be in jeopardy of not winning their next election. Um, where the way they germinate these districts, it's kind of, they're pretty safe. So anyway, here's some examples. Um, this is kind of like the example they gave you in the thing. Uh, it is the example they gave you in the thing, basically. Um, where if if 60% were blue and 40% were red, if you draw up districts like this, you can make it so that the blue controlled everything. It's kind of what Massachusetts does. Um, if the red, again, whoever controls the state house draws the map up like the year after the census. So in 2021, when the census is done and the results are back, the state houses will redraw their um, the maps. If red it controls it, they can't win all of them, but they can, even though they've only won 40%, they can, they can, they can definitely have a better representation. The perfect example is North Carolina with gerrymandering, um, how they really 
kind of rigged it so that um, they could uh, control uh, the map. Uh, again, if you look at the, the the results of the last election that we I showed you in the last video, um, it takes a while to load. I should call my I should call Comcast. I can get rid of this. Um, so. If you look at these districts, they're kind of funkily drawn. I mean, some of them, they aren't that funky drawn. I mean, I mean, Montana, they have one district. You can't draw that any funky. There's no gerrymandering that goes on there. Or in North Carolina or South Carolina or Wyoming, they have one district. Um, and even like where they have two districts, it's probably not that funkily drawn. It's pretty straightforward. Um, it's when you have a lot of districts and you can play the game. Um, Texas is controlled by Republicans, the state house. It's a Republican governor, it's a Republican state house. So when they redraw, they isolate the cities. So if you look at the cities, get out of there. All right. So here's the city, and they make a lot of small districts around the city, and don't let them spread out, like how Massachusetts does it, where our district is 32 miles away from Boston, but yet our district touches Boston. They don't have anything like that. They're all within spitting distance of the city. So they kind of isolate the cities with these districts. And they make it so that most of the, the rural areas are these huge districts, and there's a lot of them, so that they have a lot more. If you looked at the numbers, like how Texas voted, it probably would vote, it probably votes pretty close. It probably close, it's probably like around 51, 52% vote Republican and 48, 46% vote Democrat. And um, but if you look at their numbers in the delegation, they have very few Democratic uh, representatives, it's mostly Republican Democrats. Um, so, so you can tell almost if 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 a um, state has a Republican or a Democratic um, uh, state house. Again, we're looking at at how these districts were redrawn back in probably uh, 2011. They're going to all be redrawn uh, next year. So again, here's Georgia. They kind of isolate get out of there. They isolate the city so that the Democrats don't have too many districts. You don't spread it out. Um, and, um, yeah, and the other areas are, are pretty safe Republican. Again, a, a Republican from this area here is not going to worry about Democrats. There's hardly any Democrats that live in this district, but you know, if we go back to Massachusetts, um, and I'll show you again, how you, you, you use the fact that, um, a lot of Democrats live in Boston and Boston is, is huge. It's got a huge population. And uh, so if you have as many districts as possible, touch Boston. We do the opposite of what they do in the South. You, you have them touch Boston so that um, those districts become very safe democratic, right? So, all right. So one last thing, he's gonna explain the exact same stuff that I've just did. Maybe he'll explain it better for you and then we'll have the, uh, the quiz thing on it and we'll move on. But this is pretty good. We are being censored. America's censored. news outlets no longer. Hi, I'm Craig, and this is Crash Course Government and Politics. And today I'm going to talk about a topic in American politics that tends to drive people crazy. Ah! No, it's not partisanship or horse race journalism or the state of political punditry, although we could easily do episodes on all three of those. And we might. Nope, today we're going to look at the election districts and how they shape electoral outcomes. And that means, you guessed it, we're going to talk about gerrymandering. Thank goodness. Gerrymandering is a blight on our American election system. It completely thwarts the will of the majority, and it's responsible for our lopsided House of Representatives. Not so fast, my left-wing sore loser friend. Gerrymandering is not nearly as responsible for the 2014 Republican Congress as the fact that people like you self-segregated to urban enclaves of socialism. All right, calm down, clones. Gerrymandering is a little more nuanced than that. Let's talk it out. <laughs> Congressional apportionment, how many representatives each state gets, is super exciting, even though it, it only changes every 10 years. Since the number of representatives each state gets is based on population, it's important to know how many people are in each state. That's one reason, at least in the Constitution, that we have a census every 10 years. The most populous state, California, has the largest number of representatives, 53, and the least populous states have only one. Sorry, Alaska, Delaware, the Dakotas, Vermont, and Wyoming, and Montana, and the state of loneliness. 
one is the loneliest number. In those sparsely populated states, figuring out the election district, which geographic area is represented by a congressman, is easy because there's only one district. This makes elections in these states effectively at-large elections, like a state's choice for senator. Even though there are two senators from each state, they represent the entire state at large rather than only a part of it, like representatives are supposed to do. The Electoral College, the system through which Americans choose their president, are also a type of at-large election. The rest of the states are divided into what are called single-member districts. This means that each election district chooses one representative. Now, you might think it would be simple to divide a state into as many pieces as it has representatives, but why would you think that? Nothing is simple. Districts are required to be equal or almost equal in population, and in most states, populations are not evenly distributed across the entire region. The notion that election districts must encompass equal population is the essence of the idea of one person, one vote, a principle that was cast into law by the 1962 Supreme Court decision in Baker v. Carr. It means that a person's vote counts equally no matter where they live, at least as far as the House of Representatives goes. In the Senate, it doesn't actually work out because a resident of a small state like Delaware has the same number of senators, too, as a resident of California. To put it another way, in 2014, two senators represented 897,934 Delawareans, and the same number of senators represented approximately 38 million Californians. In the House, each representative is responsible for about seven to 800,000 people, which is still a lot, but much better than one senator for 19 million Californians or 13 million Texans. The idea that people should be equally represented in Congress shouldn't be controversial, and for the most part, it's not. What is controversial is the way that minority groups are represented. One of the problems of single-member districts is that they can make it easier to cut minority groups out of the political landscape. After all, if in a given state only 15% of the residents are minorities, it will be more difficult for them to elect a member of their own group, even under a plurality rule, unless that person can appeal to a large number of non-minority people. Congress and the Supreme Court have tried to remedy this problem by mandating that there be majority minority districts, which is a confusing way of saying districts where the majority of voters are members of a minority group. This is a little like affirmative action in the realm of voting, and as you might have guessed, there's a fair amount of disagreement among people who think a lot about it, although I'd bet that number itself is a pretty small minority. This idea of majority-minority districts leads us into a really fun aspect of congressional districting, the way that the districts themselves are drawn, a process known as gerrymandering after the 19th century political cartoon that depicted one particular Massachusetts district that looked like a reptile. Oh, there it is. Looks like a dragon or something. And we all know dragons are reptiles. The man responsible for this twisted district, the name of my band in high school, was Elbridge Jerry, hence the name Gerrymander. So districts have to be drawn in a way that they contain roughly equal populations. So why does it matter if they look convoluted or even somewhat ridiculous like this? Well, states don't just draw districts to make them equal in population. They draw them to capture certain population characteristics so that one party has a greater chance of electing a member from a particular district. In the district pictured here, the Illinois 4th, Chicago has been carved up to capture a certain population. Me. That's the district I live in. Usually, districts are drawn so that they can capture my vote, or a significant majority of one party or the other, virtually ensuring that a particular district will elect only a Democrat or Republican, as the case may be. You might have noticed that thin strip on the Illinois 4th's western edge connecting the upper half and the lower half. Look carefully and you'll see that it runs along the interstate, which I'm sure means that it has a huge population. Why do we do this? Because one of the requirements, according to federal election law, is that districts not only be roughly the same size in terms of population, but also that they be contiguous, meaning that they can't be divided completely by other districts. This requirement results in some pretty weird configurations. So who draws these cockamamie districts anyway? Well, they're done by state legislatures. Well, not legislatures themselves but by people working at the behest of legislatures. If one party has a majority of the state legislature, say the Democrats, they usually want to draw the district so that Democrats have a better chance of winning. Republicans do the same thing. This is why state legislature elections matter so much in census years. Whoever wins that year gets to redraw the districts. A couple of things to note here. First, there's no rule saying that states can't redraw their districts whenever they want. Texas tried to do this in 2003, not a census year prompting its Democrats to run away to Oklahoma for a spell. Second, it's possible for a state to hand the task over to a less biased expert district-drawing person, or group that might make districts more fair. Hand it over to me. I'll make them all look like little bunnies. But wait, you might ask yourself, what's wrong with this system, and why do people think it's unfair? Let's go to the thought bubble. So imagine a state that's 60% Republican and 40% Democrat and has five electoral districts, like this one. Let's call it clone Sylvania. You could draw districts so that there were three Republican districts and two Democratic ones, accurately reflecting the state's population, like this. Or you could redraw it so that there were three Democratic districts and two Republican districts, which would be an inaccurate reflection of the party composition of the state's population. Or you could simply draw the districts so that you had five Republican districts and 
zero Democratic ones, like this. So you can see, especially in the second and third examples, how gerrymandering can result in districts that don't actually reflect the political makeup of a state at all. By now, you might be fuming at the injustice of state legislatures redrawing districts to make sure that the opposing party has no chance of winning national congressional elections. And you may have read a number of articles blaming gerrymandering for the composition of the current Congress and for making congressional elections generally less competitive. There are a lot of people who feel the same way. But there's a counter-argument that it's not the state legislatures that result in solidly Republican or solidly Democratic districts, but the fact that Democratic voters tend to cluster in cities where they often outnumber Republicans by a lot, so that states like Ohio, even though the numbers of Democrats and Republicans are pretty even, with a slight edge going to Democrats, perhaps, they all tend to concentrate in urban areas around Cleveland and Columbus, so that the overwhelming majority of the state's districts are won by Republicans. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Congressional districting is fascinating and really, really important for determining the composition of Congress, but it's also quite complicated, which, as with most things, makes it difficult to understand. But unlike some other complicated issues concerning policy, gerrymandering is one that's easy to criticize because the visual results are so striking and because it can result in numbers that just look unfair. This is probably why, come election time, you'll hear a lot about it. Now at least you'll have a better idea of what those pundits are talking about and you'll be better equipped to make your own decision about the issue. But luckily for you, there's more and more data about this stuff every election and always more to learn. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Crash Course Government and Politics is... All right, so he, he talks really fast, I know, but um, my questions are mostly going to be around the idea of what basic gerrymandering is. He gave you more information than you really need. Um, but there's a lot of talk about this and I think it's a I think it's an issue. I think we can do better. In the computer age, we can draw districts that are um, that are more proportional and more fair to the people that live there. Um, and it will make it so that the representatives aren't in these massively safe districts and it'll force them to work with the other party. And when America has congressmen that are able to work with the other party to get things done all right so that's it for today um stay safe make sure you get outside and exercise and uh yeah take it easy